Hi, everybody. I am delighted to welcome Tyler Florence. It's lovely to have you here. So inspiring to share food with you at lunchtime and hear you talk about it. So. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here, guys. How are you doing? Thank you. Thank you. I love how sensory the book is, the, the photographs. They're just no clutter, just food. That is the, the, the idea behind Fresh, um, which is just clean, simple, delicious recipes that are kind of innovative in a sense. And when you uh, take a look at recipes that are, that are uh, so vibrant, right, especially because we all live in California, so that you guys will get it um, clearly that there's so much v incredible flavor to be had, right? And nutrition behind that. So it's not about a bowl of salad, right? It's about creating uh, a spectrum of nutrients and taking those ingredients and then doing really crazy fun things with them. And that's what I like about food and that's what I like about cooking. And, and that's what I wrote about in this book. And in fact, you know, people think there's a divide. There's healthy food and then there's gorgeous food. But in fact, what you're talking about, nutrient density, is flavor, right? That's what winemakers talk about. Um, I'm, a, I'm actually a winemaker as well. I, I've been making wine with Michael Mondavi uh, in Napa. And what we harvested this year is our fifth season. And um, it's, you know, it's really kind of paying attention to nature. It was, it was a fabulous harvest, by the way. 2011 was kind of a disaster just because it was so cold and foggy up in wine country. But this year, you know, it was sort of a classic storybook, kind of cartoonish uh, California summer. Just long, like, lovely, you know, warm days, kind of cool foggy nights, and, and produced... Um, just a bumper crop of Sauv Blanc, of Pinot, of Zen, of Cab, and not just quantity, but also quality. So it was, it was a really amazing season. And when we uh, when we blend um, when we blend the wine, uh, and we won 13 medals in three seasons out. So and I, I and I think our scores are speaking volumes of, of our our passion for the product. So we don't have to scream so loud about it. And I, I really really love what we're doing. And when we you you get a chance to, to kind of concentrate flavors and uh, take it from a very, very natural focus, right? So it's about taking the idea of a carrot. If you guys got a chance to eat uh, in the cafeteria earlier, like like the, the idea of, of uh, um, albacore tuna um, with uh, confit carrots and the carrot puree on top of that. So you're taking the same ingredient and kind of using it in a couple different ways. So you're having lunch, but you're also eating 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C. I think that's kind of interesting, right? Because that's what it should be. That's what food should be. So it's not about the idea of gluttony. It's about taking uh, smart ingredients and just doing something very compelling with it. So when you walk out of that, you don't have the meat sweats. You actually feel invigorated. You know what I mean? <laughs> you shouldn't get the meat sweats eating lunch. You know what I mean? <laughs> like... So, so, and I, I know you, you guys work 80 hours a week like I do, so I'm, I'm sure you know, sometimes you, you, you got to make do. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it's, um, the, the book is about um, taking one step closer to hopefully everybody that reads the book that we can have a conversation together about health and nutrition and what you put in your body on a daily basis. And hopefully you can take that information and have a conversation with somebody else about it. And, and you started telling me earlier this this path is taking you to having your own farm and that supplies you with, with yeah vegetables. well it's it's um it's, to me like it, 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 in, in our restaurants have you guys been to our restaurant in San Francisco Wayfair Tavern have you guys been up there it's good you like it it's good right I, I think we're getting better <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> like <laughs> well it was okay service was a little slow my fried chicken wasn't as hot as it was last time but but um. But we're, we're actually, you know, thinking about, you know, kind of getting just making, closing the gaps between what we serve and where we get it, right? And, you know, I have three restaurants in the Bay Area, and we spend a ton of money on produce. And a lot of things you don't necessarily get a ton of value out of that money just because there's only a few pipelines that kind of get those particular products, right? So if, if it's microgreens that are bust in from Ohio and it's $15 a clamshell and you get 50% usage out of that just because it's been on the road for 48 hours and picked 72 hours, and then, you know, you take that and add it up over the year, it's the money that we're, we could be getting value out of versus money we're spending, right? So we're actually uh, looking at some property... Um, I think 
tomorrow, tomorrow and definitely next week when I get back. But we're, we're actually looking at um, either buying a farm or leasing a farm and actually growing our own produce for our own restaurants because we spend the money anyway, right? So instead of having like the same cool little microgreen that you see on every single restaurant in town because if people kind of get on, when the, uh, when the catalogs come out from like the little microgreen companies, everybody jumps on like hearts of fire sorrel, you know, you kind of see it all over the place. Um, and we want to start, we want to be able to, to plan our own thing um, and, and really think it through. So I mean, you got to think, you got to clearly, you can't make a phone call. You got to plan the seasons out. Uh, but we're really, really excited about that. And, and, and just to have that story just a little closer, you know, between what, by the time you get it on your plate and where it came from, it's a very small circle really aligns with with our values on the food team here it's it's and and going back to nutrition when it travels less there's more nutrition retained in the absolutely, food absolutely and, and and also you, you kind of keep your money in a tighter circle too you know like i i'd much rather i'd much rather you know invest in you know a family that take care of our restaurants and what we serve than necessarily just write a check to a company and not, not, not that we don't get value at from the company but i just think they're again just trying to get one step closer to the truth and that's all what we always want to do which is get one step closer to purity and clarity and focus and flavor and and that to me is just growing it yourself and and same philosophy to seafood right you were saying earlier love the anchovies the sardines um, they need to get sexy, right? As much as ahi tuna. Absolutely. So, so if you get a chance to read uh, Flip Through Fresh, um, there's there's very interesting stories. Um, and one one story that I wrote, um, um, and, and it's 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 quick little stories. It, it's about um, eating on what they call the trophic scale, right? And the trophic scale is basically the food system. Right, so the kings of the trophic scale are predators, right? So, so it's tuna and shark and things like that. And things at the bottom of the trophic scale are things like sardines and anchovies, and you know. And then you get into plankton and phytoplankton, things like that. But but if you can eat, you know, things uh, from a a a little more diversified. So it's not so much things at the top of the trophic scale because they have to consume they consume the entire ecosystem on the way up. Right, so it's it's the little fish that you know they eats, they gets eaten by the bigger fish and the bigger fish and the bigger fish and then you catch that biggest fish, right? Um, from a calorie standpoint, that thing consumes ten times ca the calories that it'll ever give you uh, from a, a nutrient standpoint. So that is not sustainable, right? That is the 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 180 degrees from sustainability, right? So what we have to eat are things that have a shorter lifespan, um, that uh, are that reproduce quicker, like octopus for a second. Do you guys like octopus, right? So if you see octopus, octopus is, is cer certainly something that you're probably probably not going to find in a grocery store. But if you get it in a restaurant, um, especially if it's local, and there's amazing octopus up and down the Pacific coast. Like the octopus um, um, only live about a year, right? And they reproduce at six months, and they 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 consume such a, a, a minute amount of the environment, and the way they're fished with basically a bucket and a string, right? There's zero impact on anything, and they they have they're loaded with omega threes, right? And there's v like virtually zero mercury, right? So so my point is, um, if you if you can eat, make a decision on uh, and make anchovy sexy, right? And make sardines sexy. Right, almost like a Mediterranean culture. Like every time I go to Greece or go to Spain, that's all we eat are like small oily fish, and I love it. It's so delicious. Right, um, you're actually doing uh, the environment a, a gigantic favor because um, that product gets caught, right, and then uh, about 90% of it either goes, it gets turned into fish food that feeds farmed fish, right, or it gets turned into bait to catch other fish, right? So we're just, we're, we, there are enough calories to feed the planet, hands down. We're just not using it in an efficient way. There's plenty of food, but we're just not using it. We're throwing most of it out. I, that saying, um, eating salmon is like eating tiger. I mean, it's that high on the food chain. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It, re it really, and, 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 and salmon, salmon is, um, and, and, and oh, the, the, the salmon to me is another thing which I think is really kind of fascinating because everybody sees like the, the, the demise of uh, the California salmon as something that's sort of a recent phenomenon, but there's been a steady decline since like the 1860s 
you know, as, as, as populations moved west and started building whale towns up and down the Pacific Northwest and then started building dams, um, we've been killing salmon for, for a long time. And, uh, and it, it was, it was a, you know, a, a vital resource that now is starting to affect a much, much uh, deeper part of the ecosystem, and, and that's what's called biomass. So when salmon, you know, do their last, you know, uh, val most valuable thing on the planet that's reproduced, their bodies just die because it's the last thing they do. And as the carcasses start to, you know, fold into the soil, um, that, that is the reason that sequoia trees are where they are, if you really think about it. Right, because they'll they'll swim up through uh, the um, intercoastal waterways and up through the estuaries, and when they die, they feed the trees. Right, so the the mighty redwoods of the Pacific Northwest and sorry, not California up to Oregon, um, that is that is there because the salmon population is there, and it, and if you start to take that away, you know what's the other side of it? Because there's not that much. Fuel for them necessarily to eat. It's a very interesting thing, and everything inside the book. I, it's, I, I tell people all this all this all the time. It's very Googleable, right? <laughs> so you, it's like it's all you can look up every single thing in the book, and it's all the truth. Uh, and so, so it's not just about recipes; it's food, but it's also food for thought. And there's a lot of different things that you can do every single day with your wallet and your dollar because you're a lot more powerful than you think you are. It's, even with social media, because you can just got to get, turn people on to very, very interesting things just by suggesting them, right? And uh, and 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 when you when you do the right thing, uh, and it's like dropping a, a a rock in the water, and you watch the rings sort of sort of circle out. That is where we all stand right now because we're all very, very. powerful powerful and as social media becomes accessible to everybody and one person that has a smart blog and a lot of followers on Twitter or whatever like like they are just as influential as newspapers as major news sources so so we're all very powerful people and I think it's so fascinating so this your journey through um, being a young cook and television shows and books and then this then this connectedness to nature and, and the chain of life. Is that a path that you think you and I have taken, but the most young cooks take and who are in the profession? Um, you know, it, it, it's an exciting time to be a chef, and, and it's an exciting time to be a young chef because I, I think there's a lot of um, very accessible, attainable information. And, um, you know, there was a, a beef, I don't know if you guys follow this stuff or not, but, but David Chang is a big chef in New York City, right? He, uh, he took a very, um, a very publicized swipe at chefs in California and San Francisco. He said the most uh, difficult thing a chef in San Francisco has to do is go shopping, Right. <laughs> right, and and I I think the you know what I'm talking about right, and I I think the most difficult thing that any chef can do is go shopping, because if you just blindly make a phone call and say I need I need carrots I need tomatoes that and just shows up, versus actually taking you know time to carefully plan out your menu, and and to try to source the best thing from the best guy. Uh, is 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 incredibly important. And react to the taste. Be, because because the, because in. the taste it, it's it's all the difference in the world, right? So the holy grail of California cooking is all about the produce here, right? I lived in New York City for 14 years, and and when I moved out to California in 2006, it was it was one of those things to me that it was just it was probably the most important moment in my culinary career is when I, I started to dive into the California food scene and how amazing things taste. It's a difference between, say, you know, like a, a Georgia peach, right, and a California dry farm peach. Um, you can't compare the two. Like, so a Georgia peach, and there's no disrespect to Georgia peach farmers, uh, because I, I grew up in the South, so I, I grew up in a lot of, <laughs> it was raised on Georgia peaches. Um, but um, but th because, because of the ample rainfall, right, that happens in the American Southeast throughout the summer, these peaches are just really, really dense and heavy, and they're filled with water, and, and water is just sort of a flabby flavor. Right, where California peaches, because um, the way you know the, the 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 weather cycles throughout the season, like right now, we're, we're about to sort of you know get our our rain for the year, and the grounds just get completely soaked and saturated, and then throughout the summer it doesn't rain for you know 120 days, 180 days, and so through that growth cycle, the 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 trees themselves. 
Um, and it's the oldest irrigation plan on earth. And, and, you know, Mediterranean olives have been grown this way and grapevines have been grown this way. So as the plants really have to stress and find the moisture, right, and, and deepen their root system, they're going to pull minerality out of the ground as well as water, right? And so they get really these really big, beautiful, wide leaves. And, you know, the, so they're, they're getting energy through the sun, through photosynthesis, and they're getting their nutrients and they're getting the minerality through the, through, through, through the, through the, the, the proper channels, not just rainfall, right? So you'll get this big, dense, juicy peach, but instead of just like you bite into it and explodes with water, which is a really juicy peach, it's fun, but it doesn't touch the, can't touch the flavor of a California apricot or a you California peach. You are so peach. sounding like a wine grower. You, can, you just can't <laughs> touch it. Like you bite it, you bite into like a California peach in its ripest season. I mean, it's like, like a frog hollow peach is just, is just to me, like one of the, like, I, like, I, I look so look forward to the season, and the first one, I start to well up a little bit. You know what I mean? Because it's just, that is the definition of a peach, and it's so fantastic. So, so to me, the, the, the um, being a, to answer your question, to, to, to be a young chef right now um, with a, so much information at your fingertips, and, and also how chefs uh, train information back and forth at lightning speed through Instagram and through Twitter, um, it's really transforming uh, and, and, and hitting the gas on how we share information and how fast trends can, can swipe across the country, right? So um, the old model of, of sharing ideas from, uh, from a culinary standpoint, I would have to get, into a, get on a plane and fly to a city and eat in this guy's restaurant and take pictures and take notes to kind of get the idea of what it's all about. And now I see what these people uh, um, post as, for, as specials every single night. You know, so to me, like, like I, I follow, if you guys follow me on Instagram and then kind of dig through who I follow, I follow some pretty interesting people and probably some chefs you haven't heard of yet. But it, it is, it's so um, inspiring to watch creativity just unfold at real time. And, that, and that's, it's, it's a very interesting time to be a chef because, it, because the curve is, is, it used to be a big curve. You know, you have to like, you know, fill up your passport and travel and taste. And I always recommend that because you can't replace that. You can't replace the authentic. Um, but you can certainly get a very, very clear idea of what the authentic looks like, right, um, just by sharing images and video through social media. Wonderful. Really passionate stuff. Thank you. I love what I do. I really do. Um, change, I'm going to change uh, directions a little bit. Um, you were in the studio 16 years ago with your first show, cooking um, with, with real, real life people. Mm -hmm. Have we changed? Have, have, are we cooking less, I'm afraid to ask, or are, are we maybe cooking more be, because of social media because of um, the Food Network? I think, um, so I, I started in 1996. I was a guest chef on a show uh, called In Food Today, and it was hosted by David Rosengarten. I don't know if you guys know who this guy is. He, was, he had a show called, um, called Good Taste. I don't know. He, wore, he, wore, he, he was kind of, a, kind of a nerdy guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I don't know if David's going to see this or not, but he, he, I, I think he'd he could tell himself he's kind of a nerdy guy, but, but anyway, so so but he had, he he wore a tie and he was very you know you know what I'm talking about David Rosengarten anyway he hosted the show, so I was uh, I was 25 years old and I was executive chef of a restaurant called uh, Chibo C I B O uh, in New York City and uh, sort of on the on the cusps of Tudor City on 41st and 2nd and um, it was it was Italian but it was definitely sort of new American Italian and um, one of the producers from Food Network stumbled into the restaurant and and I was out walking around saying hi to people and handing me their card and said listen, call me, you know, um, we'd love to have you on this new cooking show because it was only in like New York and Chicago and Los Angeles and it wasn't really coast to coast yet. And I hosted one show and I, I mumbled and stuttered my way through four and a half minutes and I didn't know one person could sweat that much in four minutes, but apparently it's possible. And, and uh, I thought I bombed it, but the executive producer walked down and said, that was fantastic, can you come back next week? So between 96 and 99, I hosted probably 50 or 60 different guest appearances, and I was almost on television every day anyway. And then, they, and then in 1999, um, uh, probably when a lot of you were just starting college, uh, I, was, I, started, I, I hosted a show called um, Food 911. 
right? It's true. <laughs> right. Like, so I hosted a show called Food 911, and, uh, and, and it was a show where I traveled around the country, and, um, um, and I helped people out with their everyday food emergencies. So you call 911, the cops show up, and you call Food 911, and I show up, right? And, 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 we, and we shot that show for about five years, and we did, um, you know, we, I think we shot, you know, um, 150 episodes a year. I mean, it was just, it was a super aggressive schedule, but, but the, what, what I got a chance to do, it was really sort of down gear and downshift, um, w how I, um, related to people because a lot of chefs are kind of like cops, right? They kind of speak this code and they kind of live this life that only other cops can understand. So you speak cop talk and chefs kind of speak chef talk to each other, right? So I had to sort of like sh shift gears, right? And, and rethink how I approached cooking and how I approached the conversation of cooking of just really civilian, just real, real life people who never went to culinary school, who don't know what the five mother sauces are, don't care what the five mother sauces are. They're never going to make a chicken stock from scratch. So, so I had to sort of kind of like regroup, you know? So it wasn't so much about my idea of what their food was all about, but really just trying to fix their thing. And you know, don't sh hit it hit it over their head. Just really kind of give them what they want. Like literally, like my tuna noodle casserole is terrible. And I'd walk into it, I'm like, you're kind of right. <laughs> but let's fix your tuna noodle casserole because that's all she wants, right? So, so we just kind of went through the steps. Okay, here's how you can correct this. Here's how you can undercook this, but cook it correctly at the last minute. And, and, and we would take her, her, her recipe and fix it with her ingredients and her kitchen and her stuff, right? And, and it was awesome. It was awesome because I got, and, and then occasionally we did fun stuff like creme brulee and we shot so many episodes and it was, it was the first chef, it was the first chef on the Food Network to not wear a chef coat and, uh, and it, was a, it was the first show to go out of the studio, right? Uh, and, and to me it was so, it was so compelling because the, 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 sh the sh network was very chef driven, very New York City chef driven, right? And now the, the, uh, the conversation is completely wide open. And if you watch Food Network now, there's somebody on the network that speaks your language, right? And not every chef is for everybody, not every host is for everybody, um, but you're gonna find somebody who's compelling on the network. And, and I, I think that's really spectacular. Um, and, and recently, in, you know, two, two, three years ago, uh, Food Network went through what I call cell division, where they split off between Food Network and now the Cooking Channel. And it's very similar to what happened with MTV when they realized, wow, you know, we could actually make a lot more money uh, by just playing the real world over and over and over again. And these, these music videos of what we used to do, we're going to put those over on MTV too. And, and so Food Network is, is now, you know, again, you're always kind of giving people what they want and people really like to watch culinary competitions. So, so that's where, so once you get like or past around 12 o'clock, you're going to see culinary competitions. You, there, there's going to be two people in a room cooking something, best man wins all day long, right? <laughs> all day long. Uh, cupcakes, barbecue, you, you, you name it. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it's a lot of fun. And so I, I host, now I host a show called uh, The Great Food Truck Race, uh, and, uh, which, which I think is a lot of fun uh, because it's a, um, it is a, uh, it's a rock and roll business show. Um, uh, Fortune Magazine wrote an article on their online version, and, and the, it, it was uh, entitled The 10, um, 10 Things a Startup Can Learn from the Great Food Truck Race. It's all solid business practices. You know, it's all solid points. And, and that's what I really like about the show because we get a chance to hang out with uh, young, hungry entrepreneurs who really want to get into the restaurant business. And I'm in, I have sort of traditional models in restaurants. I, I raised $4 million. I went through two years of red tape and bureaucracy to get the restaurant open. And, and with that, the statistics for failure are enormous. You know, nine out of 10 restaurants will fail within the first year. That is a huge risk. But that one restaurant is going to be really, really great. So the bar has been dropped to a more approachable stance with, the great, with food trucks because a guy with an idea, you know, I want to do creme brulee, I want to do tacos, I want to do crepes, I want to do grilled cheese sandwiches, I want to do burgers, I want to do Korean tacos, I want to do ribs, I want to do chicken wings. There's like, it's the, the, there's such a, a diverse menu, which is so interesting. And, and, and every city in America is starting to really kind of develop a food truck culture. I think, I had this, and I had this idea this season, this is why I really love this show and I think it's very important because it's now the new answer to American fast food. 
It's the new answer to American fast food. At six bucks, where would you rather spend it, right? I mean, would you rather give it to the clown or would you rather like give it to some like some local hardworking entrepreneur who just got the stuff at the farmer's market, you know it's organic, you're going to look him in the eye every day, and he's going to make you a fantastic meal. That, that's, and, and, and when these trucks kind of get together at night, and that you know, thing called Off the Grid in San Francisco, which is awesome, it creates its own festival. It makes its own gravy. And so that, to me, is, is really, really compelling. To get back to your, to your answer, like, I think we're cooking a lot more than we used to cook. And I, and I, and I think we're on, the, we're on the dawn of enlightenment that we truly understand that we are what we eat. We're all machines. We're all animals. And we need high quality fuel to operate at a high level. Your brain has no clue what a calorie is. Your brain could care less what a calorie is. Your body is satiated by nutrients, not caloric intake. Your brain could care less. The higher quality food you put in your body, the less of it you're going to eat because your brain's going, cool, I'm good. I, I, I'm good. The, the meter is full, right? The poor quality food you're going to eat, the more of it you have to eat before your brain says you're full. You have to eat a lot of it before your brain says, cool, I've had enough, right? So, so we have been starving ourselves, not from gluttony and eating, but from nutrients, we are starved from nutrients. We are eating such poor quality food, mass produced food, loaded with high fructose corn syrup that your, that your body cannot process, your stomach can't process it. It gets processed in your liver as if it were alcohol. So you see adults with beer bellies and you see kids with soda bellies, right? And, and so you have to ask yourself a question. The old like PR you know, slap is that organics are expensive, but I'm asking you what's more expensive? healthy, fresh produce, or obesity and diabetes. Because that's exactly what the other side of the spectrum looks like. We're fat and we're sick, and we gotta do something about it. So I, I think we are at the dawn of enlightenment, finally understanding that you are what you eat, right? And you put high quality food in your body. Like I was talking to a woman the other night, like I, I'm, I'm you know, two week book tour across the country. And this woman uh, said to me, like she, like she, she switched, she, she stopped eating processed food completely and started eating 100% organics. And uh, <laughs> I get teared up thinking about it. She lost 40 pounds, right? 40 pounds in a year, and her doctor took her off high blood pressure medication for the first time in 20 years, right? Like, you can heal yourself through food. You eat really good quality food, and you're, you're going to lose weight, right? You're going you're gonna to sleep better. You're going to process. You're going to live longer, right? So, that's what, so we are cooking more, right? We're cooking better food. No one cares about you more than you. These fast food, these companies could, could care less about your health. If you get cancer, that's your problem, right? And, and, but they're happy to sell you stuff. They just want your money. The same thing with like big oil. They don't care if they melt the planet down. They don't care. They just want you to fill your gas tank up for hopefully another 10 years, right? That's what they want, right? So it's up to you and you and, and protecting your health and your family. And it's gotta be 100% organics or you can't trust it. You just can't trust it. You know, it's gotta be good high quality food because you're worth it. You're worth it to yourself. And what I like about the books is not so much about uh, delivering just like fancy chef recipes. Cause I, 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 when I dream of food, this is what it looks like. It's explosive, it's vibrant, right? But once you dive into it, it's about nutrition. It's about putting quality nutrition in your body. It's not about putting food in your face. Beautifully said, thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so um, um, yeah, I'm really excited about this. I'm, I'm really passionate about it, because uh, to me, like, when, when you, like, I, I fly, I, tra I travel, like you guys travel, I'm sure, and, you know, you fly through Chicago, you fly through Atlanta, you fly through Dallas, and, like, my God, like, we are evolving as, as people, but it's not, we're not evolving for the, for the better. Like, we're heavy, right? And this is all, and, and you know what I'm talking about, and, and it's really like, and I feel so bad for these people because, these, because they, 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 drink, they drink soda and they drink Coke and they drink these things that, like, if you know, if you drink one Coke a day, one Coke a day, you put on 15 pounds in a year, right? And also high fructose corn syrup blocks a, blocks a hormone in your body called leptin, right? And, and it, it, it blocks the signal that tells that your, where your brain tells you that you're full, Right? I mean, this is how food is manipulated, 
Why, I want you to drink more of it. I'm going to put salt in it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to create a chemical that's going to shut your brain off from telling you've had enough. And I'm going to make it salty. And I'm going to make you drink a lot of it. Awesome. And, and it's going to cost me 10 cents for every 16 ounces to make. I'm going to sell it to you for six bucks. That's a margin. And, right? and a can of Coke is about two cases of broccoli and you eat one tenth of that case and you're completely full. You're completely full. So, and, and, th and this is my point. So, so, so it, it's, about, it's about making a decision that you're going to put fresh food first in your life, right? It's about making that clear, honest decision that healthy is the way to go, right? I want you to think about that and I want you to have a conversation with somebody else in your life, right? Because we all know somebody that we probably needs to have that conversation with, right? And then do something about it, right? You know, it, it's like, it's like when, when people, when people, um, um, we've all been convinced that we don't know how to feed ourselves anymore, right? We've all been convinced. But I, I, I think this generation, like us, right, I think we know better. And I, and I think it's, it's our turn to, to stop the turnstile, turnstile of just bad information and poor eating habits and just empty calories and blindly eating things that, that aren't organic and you don't know where they come from. And, and, and we just insist on transparency. And I, I think that, that, that's the new thing about social media. It's a new thing about so much information being accessible. It's about transparency. Like I said, everything in this book is Googleable, right? You can search it up yourself and you can find the same information. So I, I'm sure people have a lot of questions, um, but I'll turn it over to, I'll let you ask your one question to the engineers in the, uh, your request to the engineers in the audience. Oh, so, so, so we're just talking about Google Plus earlier. Uh, how, how many people, team members are working on Google Plus in here? One, one. Well, so, the, so the, this is going to the guy in the back. So, so to me, this, and this is well, this is really kind of interesting, right? Because like, like you know, like uh, I am, I just signed on with Google Plus, right? So I'm trying to figure out how to make that work because now I, I manage uh, my Twitter feed, my Facebook feed, my uh, my Tumblr feed, my Instagram feed, and now my and now my G G Plus feed. So I I manage like five social media sites off my off my phone, right? And it's it's kind of clumsy. Right, so to me, like I, I, I think instead of trying to get into that bloody pool of sharks to compete with that social thing, you should create create a platform that exists at ten thousand feet, so people can manage everything else below them, right? So, so that that to me is probably the smartest position that you guys can take instead of just trying to trying to think through, okay, how can I get another group of people that want to go after fans and likers and that kind of stuff? Because I mean, it just after a while, it's like I don't I don't really. You know, you kind of put things in priority. My, my Twitter account, I have a half a million people following me on Twitter. That is a little more important than my Facebook because I've been tapped at 5,000 and I don't really know them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I look at their pictures of their, their, their kids and stuff in, on vacation and I don't know, the, I don't know them. They were friends. I mean, but I don't, I mean, are we friends? I mean, really, we're friends? I mean, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know you. I mean, I answer your question a couple times a year, but I don't know you. Um, so anyway, it might, it, might, it might be a smart position to take to not go here, but go here and, uh, and let people, because they, they, they still have their connection. I mean, they've got, a, they've got a big investment in Facebook, right? Because that's where they, you know, that's where the, <laughs> that's where the grandparents see the picture of the grandkids, right? And uh, they've got a big connection through Twitter because I don't really watch live TV anymore. Do you guys watch live TV? And isn't it amazing, right? I, so, and, and this is a generational thing too, because I, like, like as I travel around and kind of talk to people, um, the, like uh, my parents' generation still love to watch television. But my generation, I watch my DVR, right? I love Homeland, you know, I love Boardwalk Empire, you know, um, I, you know, and other than a live sporting event, I don't really watch live TV for anything, right? So, so it's, it's, about, it's about how I, I extract information out of the world. I don't turn the television on to get news anymore. I just stroll, I go through my, my Twitter feed, and it's got national news, it's got local news, it's got traffic news, it's got weather news, it's got, you know, people I follow, like Drunk Hulk. I think, I don't know if you guys follow him. He's a funny guy. You should follow him on Twitter. He's, he's, he's angry, and he's had a lot to drink. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he talks in all caps. Drunk Hulk. Check him out. Uh, but um, um, but how, how we extract information, I think, is really great. So people have a lot of investment. You know, I, I've been on Twitter since 2008, and it's taken me a long time to kind of get a half a million people together. So I would never dump that 
and with a preference to something else because I appreciate those relationships that I have. I have different relationships with people on Instagram that I have on Twitter, right? So it's almost like a different circle and that's always been, you know, Google's philosophy about having like different circles of people and how they cross over. But it's not so much about that as it is creating a platform that exists above it all so you can go into one place and kind of manage everybody simultaneously. That's the missing thing. So it's all about the consolidation. It's so, so as Twitter and Facebook consolidated the internet, right? Because before that, it was just a big gigantic phone book, right? So now, now that consolidation has been fragmented. Now another consolidation of those fragmented consolidations needs to happen. So I think that's a very interesting position to take. Okay, heard. Right. All right. Um, there's a mic over here if you have questions for Tyler. You're a person of a lot of power, right? With the skills that you have, the platform that you have, and the connections that you have. And you'd also talk about wanting to create something sustainable and um, you know, being able to kind of restore this world to the way it used to be, or to good. Um, how are you using that power to, to, like you talk about making anchovies and starting sexy, like how are you doing that? Um, you, you know what, to me, like what, what I'm doing, uh, you and I are having a conversation right now. So that's what I'm doing something about. It. Um, I wrote a book uh, called Tyler Florence Fresh, and, and I, I think I think there's so much great information. I'm, I'm gonna say you asked me what I'm doing about it. I'm like I'm writing a book, and it's not so much about the book because honestly, like like th as far as what I do to make money, I don't make any money writing books. But 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 I, I do think it's a it's a really powerful way for us to have a conversation. There's a chapter on anchovy. Yeah, a whole. That's what I'm saying. I can I can read from the book if you would like. <laughs> <laughs> and then one last quick question: sure. Where does a chicken from? Wayfair Tavern come from? Where is it for the chicken? Yeah. Uh, it comes from Mary's Farm. It's organic, air-dried, air-chilled chicken uh, from Petaluma. Uh, it's fabulous stuff. We, we actually buy so much chicken that we dictate their feed, right? And it's really, really delicious stuff. Great. Thanks. Yeah, problem. Hey, Tyler. Uh, my name is Derek. and uh, Everybody say hi to Derek. I've always been a fan of uh, Tyler's Ultimate, so uh, I still have the spaghetti and meatballs recipe in my head. Beef, you know, veal, and pork. Well, thank kudos. you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, so uh, one, one one quick question, and then just one really quick question. Um, you've always like, obviously been very successful. You've you know done a lot of TV shows, done a lot of restaurants, done your own stores. Uh, just so just for a takeaway for us as you know we're engineers or people working at Google, what's one kind of trait or quality that you've really discovered going through all this that's really key to kind of uh, being successful as a leader, being successful as uh, a colleague, a coworker, and as a peer to to you know people you work with every day. I'm just curious, kind of what's what's the kind of one thing that sticks with you? Um, and I think, I, I think you got to be honest. I think you got to you got to be honest. I think yeah. you got to say the right thing. I think you got to listen to people, I, and I, I think you got to tell people the truth. I think you got to be honest. I, I think that that is uh, to me like like when we make our when we make our wine, I want to make a very honest, pure product. When people come in our restaurants, like I want to have a very authentic experience. When I write my book, I want to tell you like from my perspective, what I think is is just the best, easiest, quickest, cleanest, clearest, most delicious thing you can make. And 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 I, I think you got to be able to you know talk to people and answer them and give them very honest answers. You know, and I think you got to be. I think that's the most important thing ever is honesty and transparency. Awesome. Um, and a quick question. I know you probably get asked this a lot, but I've heard it asked to other chefs. Uh, last meal you could ever have, um, you know, you're going to be off this planet tomorrow. Yeah, right. You have one option. <laughs> what is it? So, um, so I, I, you know, the, it's all about the pendulum swing. You understand this, right? So if you like chocolate, you have to like running shoes. You say you have to, right? And, and to me, like, I, I, think the, I think the last thing I taste, I really wanted to be the first thing I ever tasted, right? And to me, like, the, the rootsy, authentic American cooking from the American South, the heritage cooking, right, is probably the last thing I want to taste. So it's somewhere between, like, fried chicken and collard greens and barbecue and grits. Awesome. Maybe one plate of that. I think that, I would be very, very happy. Thank you. Of course. Hi, Tyler. Thanks Hi. for coming to talk to us. Yeah, of course. What, what's your name? Uh, Phil. Everybody say hi to Phil. Hi. Um, so you seem pretty positive about um, food trucks and food truck culture, and you know that's something I agree with. So do you think um, like we have enough food trucks? You mentioned that they're like a viable alternative to you, fast food. The, so the, uh, have we had enough food trucks? Do we have enough? Are do we have enough, enough food trucks? Serving San Francisco and serving... I, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know where the ceiling is for that as a business model, um, but um, it, it's very compelling. And, and um, so the great food truck race, we didn't invent food trucks, but we've gassed the industry so much that we've created uh, two separate fires, if you will. We've created a show that shows how 
doable it is. Not saying it's easy, but how doable it is from an operation standpoint that you can own a food truck, right? So the old business model of putting in $4 million and going through two years of construction and that kind of stuff, and the failure rate is very, very high. Um, but a, a food truck, you can uh, lease a truck, have it skinned, get a business license, um, you know, uh, get, get a health inspection, go to Costco and buy some food, or, go, or go, go to like a local farmer's market and buy some food, and you can be in business next weekend for like 10,000 bucks. Right. Right. So that's about lowering the bar. Right. And make it more accessible to everybody. On um, the other fire that we created is really about creating a fan base for the for the genre. So when we shot season one of the great food truck race, um, we nobody knew what the show was all about. Right. So we would drive these like little towns of Tennessee and they're like food trucks. What's a food truck? Right. But now we're into season three, and we're at pre-production for season four right now. Like, like three, four, five, six thousand people will bombard a town because they know we're going to be there, and they hunt the trucks down as if it were a treasure hunt, right? And then, and then now, uh, so many different municipalities, big and small, are starting to understand the social value of trucks themselves, and when they gang them together. And, and get a band and call it something, it's a really cheap festival to put on, right? And everybody wins because like the, the small operators get to make some money and they like being together, creating a whole culture out of it. And as a chef, it's a very respectable, even cool thing, cool, edgy, urban thing to go do to have a food truck, especially something that's very popular. So this, this is something that I was actually going to ask you is that are you aware of young chefs bootstrapping their careers out of food trucks? Yeah. So this is happening. This is great. Yeah, so, so yeah, absolutely. They're, they're, and, and people are sort of, instead of creating a brick and mortar business, they're creating a food truck business and backing that into a brick and mortar business. So you're actually kind of testing the business model and on, on a very micro level where nobody can get hurt, right? I mean, if, if you lose 10,000 bucks of your aunt's money, I mean, she may hate you at Christmas, but she's not gonna hate you forever, right? You lose, you lose an investor's $4 million in a restaurant, you got a problem, our lawyers are gonna talk, right? So, so, that, so it, it's about, it's about, um, it's, it's about you know, creating um, uh, a, 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 a new wave of restaurants, of un these, these, these like, these urban, wonderful experiences that you can go up to a truck and order something that, that you know, a, a trained professional chef is back there making, right? So they're choosing this business model over, you know, so it's four wheels over four walls. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Hi. Hi, Tyler. I'm Rachel. Everybody say hi to Rachel. <laughs> hi, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. I have to tell you that uh, my husband and I dated for about five years, and he proposed to me the same week I first made your roast chicken, so I think there's a... <laughs> So thank nice. you for that. You know, thank you it's for pushing closer. him along. <laughs> it's an absolute deal closer. <laughs> Best thing ever. I love that. Um, so what I'm curious about is, I, I've seen cookbooks from like the 1940s and 50s, and there's just some horrific things going on there with like Jello and stuff like that. What's well, so much Jello? <laughs> <laughs> I think but, some of those books are actually really gorgeous. Well, they're yeah. they're neat to have. I think yeah. as like a sort of a I don't know an heirloom of sorts. But I'm wondering about trends you see now that aren't going to be sustainable. I mean, I think fresh food's one thing. I think Trends that's got, that aren't going to be sustainable. Right. Things like, you know... Well, I, I think that's the, a definition of a trend, right? Right. But like, right. What, what's going on right now that everyone's like, this is going to happen forever that is not going to happen forever? So we, we live in a post-molecular world, right? So molecular gastronomy right. that was sort of just, you know, caught the world on fire and, you know, the late 90s blew up in the 2000s. And then, you know, right now, I think everyone has kind of tasted it and been there and done it, figure out the recipes, knows how to knock it off and whatever, right? So um, I, th I think some of that stuff is kind of interesting, but the, the new trend, which I, I think is sustainable, um, is this idea of, of the sourcing list, right? So it's not so much about making a phone call and getting t uh, tuna flown in from Hawaii, but making a connection with a guy on the west coast of the United States who's going to go and catch the fish and drop it off your back door, closing the gap as much as possible, right? So, and again, if you follow me on Instagram and kind of follow the chefs I follow, I mean, how they source stuff and where they get stuff from is just awesome. Mm -hmm. It's just awesome. So to me, like having that tighter connection and keeping your money in a pretty tight circle and because and, like th there, are, there are mushroom geeks 
and every major part of the United States, right? <laughs> so if you can connect with a mushroom geek, right, someone who's going to go forge some chanterelles for you or forge porcinis or forge morels in the spring and, 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 uh, and, and even maybe cultivate some interesting, you know, uh, Japanese-style mushrooms, like that to me is really, really fascinating. Mm. And that's, that's where chefs now are really earning their stripes, mm. Right, because anybody can make a nice scallop, right? But show me something I've never seen before, right? right? Show me an ingredient. Show me like, an, like it's not so much about the piece of parsley, but it's actually having somebody harvest parsley at a very young age, where it's sort of in its infancy, so you can see how beautiful it is. This stuff is amazing. You know, I we're uh, we're actually we got this farmer who's going to start growing fava beans for us in the spring, and then we've actually told him to not clip it. Like I want the bean as it starts to break through the shoot. I want the, I want the shoot, the bean, and the and the and the root. I don't want to wash that off, and I want to put that on a plate. Right? That to me is really exciting because you see how gorgeous and simple nature really, really is. Like, and that's sustainable. And I think a lot of chefs are doing that today. So when David Chang said the hardest thing San Francisco chefs have to do is shop, you're right, it is. It's very difficult. Hi, Tyler. Hi. I'm Moniza. Hi, Moniza. How are you? Do I say hi? <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm a huge fan. I follow you on Instagram and Twitter. Oh, thank you. Um, so I saw that you place a lot of emphasis on organic and you know, clean food. Um, in San Francisco, since most of us live in the Bay Area, if there was one restaurant that you could recommend to everybody in this room, that kind, besides apart from your own, that sure. really places an emphasis on organic and clean food, what would you recommend? I like Greens at Fort Mason. Have you guys been there? It's been there forever, um, and, it, and the, the food is always so interesting. It, it's a it's a vegetarian vegan restaurant, and um, it's so delicious. It's in Fort Mason, um, so if you guys are up up in up in San Francisco, I, I, I would that would be my go to answer for what you're saying. Okay. I love greens. Me too. <laughs> um, yeah. I love vegetables. Yeah. Um, also, one more quick question. So you and Bobby Flay are definitely my favorite Food Network personalities. Is he as nice as he is as he seems like on the Food Network? <laughs> Can you guys turn the camera off? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Okay, you know, um, 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 Bobby is a very, very dear friend of mine, uh, and Stephanie March, uh, his, his lovely wife, is a very dear friend of mine, and um, uh, Sophie, their, their, their daughter, is, is a, a very good family friend. Like, we vacationed in France together. Um, at, when I first started on Food Network in 1996, Bobby Flay held my hand and introduced me to agents and introduced me to lawyers and said, this is what you got to do. Here's the first step. And no one else gave me that sort of attention other than him. He's a very, very good friend of mine. I wouldn't be where I am today without him. He wrote a Ford for my first cookbook and made that successful. And he's, he's an awesome guy. Nobody works harder than Bobby Flay. Tell he's him I said guy. hi next time you see him. I will. I, will, I, will. <laughs> I love him. I'll, Thank I'll you. be happy to do that. Yeah. Hi, Tyler. Uh, hi. Thank you for coming to speak to us today. Of course. My name What's is your name? Alyssa. Uh, Alyssa? Yeah. I, who do I say hi to Alyssa? Hi. <laughs> so I was actually going to ask the same question of what your two to three favorite restaurants were in the Bay Area. Um, but since she just asked it, I'll ask another question. Sure. You speak very highly about organic food, and I think it's become kind of a craze. It's become well accepted, but I've heard a lot of different things about eating organic food. Some people are like, oh, you should only eat organic meat. Don't worry about anything else. Or you just kind of blanket organic food from everything from meat to thin-skinned vegetables. What are, what are your thoughts on that? So you, you you have to eat as close to as close to the source as possible. You know, so so the um, the you know it's really shocking if you understand what the FDA and the USDA and the Department of Agriculture like 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 how little they actually pay attention to what's in the food supply, right? So 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 companies that create um, GMO seeds, they don't have to prove that it's not healthy, right? And, and we, it's one big, massive science experiment that started with high fructose corn syrup in the early 70s when it was introduced. And you see where we are today, right? High fructose corn syrup is probably the most poisonous thing you ever put in your body, right? Um, and then the idea of a genetically modified s seeds. And, and so it's not so much about trying to make that more disease resistant. It's about control, right? And, and when that kind of thing happens, you lose um, species diversification, you lose, see you lose seeds, right? And, um, and, t and w if they develop a seed in a plant that, that is um, insect, has an insect repellent sort of designed in its, in its DNA, what do you think that's going to do to your body, right? What do you think that's going to do? 
So they don't have to prove because it's considered safe um, for, from the FDA. They don't have to prove that it's not safe. As a matter of fact, if they, they don't even have to have, be inspected. But if you have an organic farm, right, you have to go through so much red tape to prove that your product is organic, right? That's by design. They want to make it very, very difficult for you, right? So consumer choice is up to you, right? So if, if you insist on that kind of thing, and I would insist on it from your own health because you don't know what's going on in the product. Again, these companies that create these things, they're not interested or concerned about your health. They're just not, right? They're really interested in what's in your wallet, right? And if you get cancer, it's your problem. Right, but but we are a very very hardy lot. We've been around since the dawn of time. We've been eating food for a long time, and these health concerns are only 30, 40 years old. I'm not saying that that um, genetics doesn't have something to do with it, but as sick and as obese that as we are as a nation, right? Um, it's all diet related. So if if so, my question to you is. If it's not organic, can you trust what it is, right? Now, it, like, th uh, there's a lot of farmers at the farmer's market that produce organic goods, but that are in the process of becoming certified organic, and that's just as good, right? There's a lot of things you really got to think about. Um, so economic recovery starts in your very own community, right? So you got to keep your money tight, right? You can't take your money, spend it, and have that source drip to, to be funneled outside of your community. You have to keep your money in a very, very tight circle, right? So if you buy your goods from a guy who just grew it not too far from here, you're helping the economy grow, right? You really, really are. Uh, and, and so th that to me is what I would recommend. So, so you, you know, to, and then we, can, we can talk all day about, you know, the health qualities of, of not just eating organic beef, but drinking grass-fed milk, organic milk as well. Um, you know, the, the, there's the French paradox, which is really interesting about how, you know, people in France like eat a very high-fat diet, but they have um, such a low cholesterol rate and such a low rate of heart disease. Way, they eat way more fat than we do, but they're, what, what they eat is purer than what we eat, right? And they eat a lot of um, uh, probiotic-rich foods like you know, whole, whole milk cheese that, is, that has all the, all the um, molecules um, and really kind of good, healthy bacteria that kind of keep your digestion system nice and clean. So you got to eat pure, clean food. Right? It's not hard. This is what I'm saying. Like we've all sort of like, you know, what's the big direction? What's the new diet? Is it Atkins, Paleo? Paleo is actually really kind of interesting, I think. But but it's the, it, you you just got to eat good, wholesome, healthy food. It's simple. Just eat clean, fresh, healthy food. Thank so you. I, thank you. And I have one recipe request. Sure. Yeah. Go on. If I could find it anywhere, do you have the recipe for the popovers you make at Wayfair Tavern? <laughs> Not healthy at all. It's so delicious. Well, you know, well, you, well it's it's like it's it's um it, it, it's actually like it, like to me like um it's um it's actually because it's a big puff of air, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? I haven't like weighed out from a calorie standpoint like what's the difference between our popovers um, versus you know whatever I don't know focaccia or something, <laughs> right? But um it's basically just a big crusty ball of air. Right. Well, it's delicious. So yeah, it's like Oliver. the webby, the webby crusty stuff is actually really beautiful. <laughs> and the air doesn't have any calories. There's no calories in the air. <laughs> There's something really funny. We, 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 uh, I went with my wife and a very good couple friend of ours to Il Bui and Rosa, Spain last year before they closed. And 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 like it was a very expensive dinner. It was like four thousand bucks a couple, right? Very expensive dinner, right? And but one of those things you you have to go do because uh, now it's closed and I can say I did it and that kind of thing. Um, regret is more, I think, is more expensive. <laughs> but everything was just jacked up with air <laughs> from, from, a, from, a, from a method standpoint, right? So everything was just spongy and light and air, like, like effervescent. And like, I'm like, wow, this guy's food cost must be awesome. Because <laughs> everything, it's like, instead of like putting it on the plate, he'll puree it, whip it with air, and put a spoon of that on the plate. I mean, that's how you, that's how you get good food cost, man. Good tip. Light Thank is clear. <laughs> anyway, so, so to answer your question, so, so um, um, the book I wrote before this is called Family Meal. And the recipe for our popovers are in that book. Awesome. I'm going to run welcome. out and get it. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> My name's Annie, by the way. Hi, Annie. How are you? <laughs> um, so I, I try to cook a lot at home, and I know you put an emphasis on 
organic, healthy, clean food. And um, I was wondering if you have any advice on where to shop. Um, you know, I try to go to the farmer's market on the weekends, but that's not always available during the weekdays. Right. Um, so, like, is Whole Foods the best place to shop? I think, I think Whole Foods is fabulous. I, 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 just, uh, I was just in Austin. So I, I, I bumped into um, one of the um, media relations people with Whole Foods in Austin. And, um, and I, I, you know, I, just, I love their philosophy. Like, not only do I buy food there, but I buy all, all my vitamin supplements and stuff like that. So a big portion of my refrigerator is just filled with, like, you know, vitamins and super green food and things like that. So I can, can like, really carefully monitor my nutrition intake. And um, um, every piece of food in this book was purchased at Whole Foods. Every, every, every bit of it. I bought everything at Whole Foods, like, for, like 7 o'clock in the morning, you know, went home, prepped for about two hours, three hours, and then we started shooting for the rest of the day. So, so I, I, I like them a lot. I mean, I, I don't work for them or anything, but I, I, just, I dig what they talk about. Right, because you also mentioned, you know, buying within your area, buying local, but that's not always possible, so... Whole Foods would be. A I, good I, I, I do. I do think it's possible. I, I, I do think it's possible. So, so, so l let's talk about a ceremony, right? So, so um, there's usually a farmers market. There's, there's got to be a farmers market down there, right? There's got to be, right? Yeah, so, so um, um, on the on the weekend, you have to kind of get into a, a mode of like having a ceremony, right? It's like a thing that you do all the time that you really like a lot that you kind of feel like that's your church or whatever. That that's your thing that you go do just to have a, a, a you know an hour or two. That's a a great head cleaner. Right, and I think strolling around the farmers market is fantastic. It's it's great. But you, you know? need to like plan out your meal for the week. You don't. You don't. This is you, you 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 don't. This is what I'm saying. So so this is this is where like I think I think like like we have been conditioned to feel like we have to put so much work into planning and writing down and taking notes and planning and planning and that's just exhausting, right? You should just go and just be inspired, right? And just go and go. Oh my God, the broccoli looks fantastic. I'm gonna roast that. Right, so um, one of the, the the best easiest ways to cook vegetables, and and you need a sheet pan, and you need a bottle of olive oil, a little bit of salt and pepper in your oven, and it works for everything. And it's just simply roasting, right? So butternut squash, broccoli, carrots, green beans, zucchini, cauliflower, eggplant, you name it. Like if you cut it into consistent sizes, and you put it into a sheet pan, a little bit of olive oil, salt and pepper in the oven, 350 degrees for 10 or 15 minutes, and it transforms the starches into sugars, and my kids love it. They'll eat anything if it's roasted, right? They love roasted carrots. They love roasted Brussels sprouts, right? And so boiled is kind of tragic. But so anyway, you can, and it works with like big leafy greens too. I mean, you can, you can roast like, kale. make kale chips. And that's delicious as a snack. So, so you don't have to, don't plan so much because it just people like, it makes people panicky when they got to plan. When am I going to plan? You should plan a <laughs> dinner party, right? You should plan the holidays, Right, but if it's just like you're just cooking money through Friday, just go to the store, just see what's going on, and that, and then you're gonna come back with more inspiration than you walked in with from a planning standpoint. Just, just go check it out. Bye. Thank you. And you yeah, have yeah. been inspiring. Thank you so much. Liv, thank you very much. Google, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm so. Thank you. Mm -hmm.